here at the Ethan Allen Homestead that we have once a month on the third Sunday of every month. I'm so, I'm so glad you could join us. Uh, the, the free Sunday lectures are sponsored by M&T Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, and AARP of Vermont, for whom we are very grateful. And uh, my name is Tom Sharpley, and I'm the manager of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. And let me advertise some upcoming events that we have. Oh boy, next weekend, May 25th and 26th, we're going to have our first of our reenactment weekends. What does that mean? That means we have a fire in the Allen House, and we cook food, and there are the Whit Whitcombs Rangers, who are a, um, a, a reenacting regiment, will be here and camped for two nights, Friday and Saturday night, and they'll be camped after the homestead. And then we have a whole schedule of events. So come, come to that, please, on the 25th and 26th next weekend. And then on June 16th is our next free Sunday lecture. And the speaker is here, right here, Doug Slaybaugh. And his speech is entitled, When a Presidential Election Led to Civil War and Three Times It Almost Did. Is that, is that close enough? That's, that's exactly. OK. All right. And now I'm going to introduce the. Uh, Angela Moody, who's going to introduce our speaker. All right. Yeah, I'm Angela Moody, former board member, um, but still volunteer and docent and doing lots of fun things around here, um, including a book discussion that we have four times a year. Um, but I'm here to introduce Laura Mac. I know I'm going to screw this up. Macaloosa. I've been pronouncing it Malacusa all week. I get it always. My bad. <laughs> no, it's totally good. Um, I do just want to just tell you that. Um, the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum is um, a 501c3, um, so we are a nonprofit museum. And um, your donations are very welcome, and we do appreciate them, so thank you. Um, so, there are few prominent Americans as associated with a place as Thomas Jefferson is with Virginia. The heart of the Jefferson County is his house. In the heart of Jefferson County is his house and plantation at Monticello. But Jefferson traveled the breadth of his home state from his time at William and Mary in Williamsburg to the new state capital at Richmond and his retreat and plantation at Poplar Forest near Lynchburg. In the beauty of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Jefferson was inspired to write his only book, Notes on the State of Virginia. And Laura Macaluso, I said it right, <laughs> is here to present some of the history embedded in these places as she take you on the public history of Jefferson's Virginia. She's a researcher, author, and grant writer focused on monuments, museums, and material culture. She's the author of 10 books. Wow, I'm impressed. I'm the author of only three. So. <laughs> That's pretty great. That's pretty great. Um, multiple chapters and edited collections, book reviews, and blog posts. She has a PhD in the humanities with a focus on cultural and historic preservation, and an MFA in creative writing with a focus on nonfiction. Laura serves as the vice president of the Amelia S. Giffen Free Library and is a volunteer at the Appalachian Trail Museum and Pine Grove Furnace State Park. Where is that? Halfway on the Appalachian Trail. Halfway on the <laughs> Appalachian Trail, which is what's here. <laughs> For those north, for those who are interested in Benedict Arnold, she recently published an essay about his house in New Haven, Connecticut, and she has a website that you can go to. Um, if you go onto our website at the ehiam.org, it will be listed there. So, without further ado, thank you, Angela. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here, but um, museum folks, can we get these lights turned down just a tad? Museum people, Angela, sorry, can we get the lights turned down? Oh, yes. So you can see the slides a little bit better. Thank you. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I drove oh, okay. up last night uh, from Connecticut, where, is, where I'm originally from, and my parents still live in, well, they lived in Florida for 10 years, but last year they moved back to Connecticut. So I'm kind of happy about that because um, it's easier to get to from my current home in Pennsylvania. Um, I live near, uh, on the way to Gettysburg. And my husband actually is a museum director. He's the uh, CEO of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. So we have spent our lives um, kind of doing this, thank you, perfect, doing this kind of work, um, 
you know, alone, but we live together, you know? So it's kind of, I get a little bit of what he has and he gets a little bit of what I have. Um, and so where to start, where to jump in? Um, I was driving up here today, right? Comes up with this idea and he finally can kind of make it happen, make it so um, at, towards the end of his life because he's busy and <laughs> he's doing lots of things, right? For local, state, country. He's got a lot of service to do before he can kind of retire back to Monticello and make the dream of his university come into being. And so he's really at the end. He's like in his 70s um, when this starts coming to fruition because they have to get it passed, the idea passed in the house. Um, he has to get support. He has no money, so where is he gonna get the money to build this thing? He's gotta get a lot of pieces together. But he's so interested in education that he actually he writes out the curriculum. He chooses the faculty, you know, and he designs the university. The architecture is all TJ all the way, and it is today, so it's pretty fabulous. You're walking through his mind, basically, when you're walking this campus, right? Here's what it looks like, kind of in this early view. Imagine his house, Monticello. I can't remember which one it is. It's up on the mountain. He's looking down into the valley of Charlottesville. Um, the central building is the rotunda. Here it is, the rotunda. It has two arms that come out and then two lengths of buildings going this way. So again, you're creating what they call the lawn, right? And this is where the students live with the faculty back in the day. It's not like that today, but it was. So that faculty and their, faculty and their families were in the, the building and the students were kind of below them and they could kind of watch over, make sure they weren't doing anything, um, you know, too crazy. One interesting uh, early student, Edgar Allan Poe. One semester he lasted. <laughs> they, they've uh, kept his room actually. It's, it's kind of like a little tourist homage to, to Poe. Um, this is where uh, Thomas Jefferson gets a lot of his ideas for architecture from, right? It's not gonna be indigenous American, it's European. It's Western European. It is from the Renaissance, which took from the ancient world, from the Romans and the Greeks. It's a redo. You know, every couple of hundred years, it's a redo for neoclassicism. And that's kind of what we have here is another version, Andrea Palladio's uh, architecture. You, doesn't this look a heck of a lot like the rotunda I just showed you? Can I go back? Oops, this one. All right, looks a lot like a building in Rome called the Pantheon, right? Pantheon in Rome is a temple. Pantheon means to all gods. Who's Jefferson's God? Who's in the rotunda? If you love education, what would you put in your most sacred building? What would you put? It's a library. Right? The center of life for his university is the library. Oh, so I don't know what this is. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. Um, this is kind of a, uh, you know, maybe early 20th century view looking down towards the rotunda and then you can see all the little buildings all the way down and all the columns. And um, he actually designed each, each of these buildings that go down, maybe there's three or four on each side in a different style of the classical so that students would be learning as they're walking. Okay, you know, here's the Etruscan style and here's the Ionic style, here's the Corinthian style. It's like beating, beating them over the head with it. Um, this is the rotunda from the other side and you might remember this view because this is TJ, so probably 1890 monument, Moses Ezekiel, I think his name is. And he's holding the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, which in, for Thomas Jefferson, the separation of church and state is important. And he drafts this for his state of Virginia, so they're paying you know, homage to him there. But it's that statue that these people, do you remember in 2017 when the United States was really caught up right, in 
Um, this is before Black Lives Matter because this is before George Floyd's death, but things were already on a, on a, I don't know, we were heading towards something. Thank you, thank you. We're heading towards something not good. And so these are Unite the Right rally people who came. This is the statue right there of that. And they came with tiki torches one night in August 2017 to protest. And the next day in Charlottesville is the day that a young woman counter protester was run over, hit by a car, and she died. Right, Heather is her name. Um, so I think by bringing this in, um, I'm just suggesting that a, a monument, a historic building, a historic campus, they, and we know that now because we've been watching what's been happening just these past two weeks at elite universities like Columbia, et cetera. These places are not dead spaces, right? They are being used, they are being, you know, reworked and rethought and, you know, um, why do they, should we keep the statue of Jefferson? I mean, that's part of this, you know, conversation too. Is it dangerous to keep statues now? I, you know, there's just a lot going on that we have to contend with um, as Americans and he's right at the center of things as usual, right? Oh, let's see. I'm as happy nowhere else and in no other society and all my wishes end where I hope my days will end at Monticello. He's writing from Paris. I <laughs> know there he is five years in Paris and he's like, when can I go home? When can I go home? You know, like, like George Washington, get me back to Mount Vernon, get me back to Mount Vernon. They just love their homes so, so much. Um, he does end, right? He does take his dying breath at Monticello, so he kind of foresees his own eventual ending, which comes around on what special day? There you go. So um, Monticello is often in literature called an essay in architecture because um, what you see looks I mean, this building looks very much like the back of the nickel. If you still have coins in your purse, which most, and we don't anymore, but remember the nickel, it looks, yeah, you have one. Um, it looks just like this because this is the third and last version of Monticello. But he tore down two previous versions on the same site, right? So it's an essay because you can erase and rewrite just like you do with an essay at school. And it allows him you know, opportunities to incorporate new things that he thinks of later, you know, maybe new technologies, new ideas, and then probably in the end, he just probably runs out of time, like we all do, or runs out of money, right? And so you kind of get what you get, and that's, that becomes the Monticello that we all know today. Um, and, you know, it, yeah, it's beautiful, but he's on the mountaintop, and like right below him, is his vegetable garden. And this is, he can watch his enslaved people. This is Mulberry Row, right next to the house, right? So he's not putting the vegetables too far out to the field. He's keeping them right there. Because number one, okay, he does love vegetables. That's, that's true. Um, but there's, you know, there's some more, more to it than that. Um, this is just a beautiful picture that I thought I'll bring for some, you know. Hmm. Do you notice? in this kind of bird's eye view that um, it's not a perfect octagon. It's kind of this crazy rotunda-esque, classical-esque building that he's brought together all those elements like from the Palladio's pattern books from Italy, right? And he's like, I'm gonna put something over here and try something over here. No house looks like Monticello. It was, it was unique. There's a lot of stuff that looks like Monticello now because they were copying Thomas Jefferson, right? So what's right from the ancient world? Well, take this right off. You could just lift this off and put it in Italy, put it in Sicily, put it, you know, in wherever, in France maybe somewhere. The pediment, the half moon window. These are, it looks like ionic columns. The, stair the podium upward so that you lift yourself up. Um, this balustrade you see right there. Chinese Chippendale, right there. His 
own little rotunda at the top, his little, so he can have this like space, um, you know, kind of sacred space above his own house, centering the house. Look at this. Oops, oops. Two arms, two arms coming out, just like at UVA, right? He's just, here it is in his domestic sphere. There's a lot of good reasons to have a house like that. And I'll tell you why, but um, first, some pretty pictures, because it's, you know, it's, it's gorgeous. You just can't deny it. Um, the entrance hall, which is the picture at the left, if you're a visitor, how many people have been? You remember, you came in through these front doors, these <coughs> doors, and this wall of indigenous artwork and tools and things of everyday life, which he's kind of gotten from whom? Who did he sponsor going out west? A lot of it coming back from Lewis and Clark and those, that expedition. And he's elevating it, though, and saying, look at this is so worthy of us taking notice of. It's kind of like an early American museum, really. Um, and I can also say that, I think, with some confidence, because these homes, Monticello is included in that, Mount Vernon is included in that, they are open to the public in the time of the lives of these men, right? It's a constantly revolving open door because they feel as though they understand they have a role to play for this new country, this American country, this American experiment, and that people look to them and admire them. And if someone's traveling through Virginia, okay, you might go to GW if you're on the east side, you might go to TJ if you're on the west side of the state, right? But there's only so many roads and it's gonna pass by these homes. And if you need a place to stay or if you need a meal, you can show up at both of these. You know, you're not gonna be like a tramp. You know, you're not gonna be, you know, you're, you're probably gonna be pretty nicely off because you're traveling in a carriage, you know, with your entourage or whatever. But, you know, you and I could show up there and ask George Washington, you know, could we have a meal? And he's not gonna sit with you you know, that would be taking it too far, but he's also not going to turn you away, right? Oh, we, I used to have numbers in my head um, for G, uh, George Washington hosted. It was insane. He hosted, I want to say, hundreds. I, I'm not going to give you a number because I, I, I can't remember it. I interpreted there for a summer and it was amazing, like hundreds of people over the course of the year. So George Washington got so tired of that constant flow that he actually built a wall <laughs> separating half his house from his private side. Um, Thomas Jefferson isn't gonna put up a wall at Monticello, but he's gonna build a second house, his retreat house, so he has somewhere to escape, and the public never goes to his private home. Um, before I let you go with this slide, the chrome yellow. Um, did anyone go to Monticello back in the day when it was blue? It used to be Wedgwood blue. This chrome yellow, 10 years maybe? Yeah, yeah, so I mean, most people, they go one time and then they think this is it, you know, this is how it should be. How can you change this? But of course, you slice through that paint, and, you know, and you do analysis and you find out, okay, they did like things really bright. I mean, that's the thing about the past, you know, like white statuary from ancient Greece. It wasn't white, people, right? It was all polychromed painted, but we've lost the paint. So if they find something like they have it in, at Monticello, they would never do anything if they didn't have some proof for it. Um, whether it's the actual, you know, final color, uh, you know, anything can happen. Who knows? Okay. Um, what is underneath, though? The thing is, it looks so nice from the outside and it's clean and tidy and elegant and historic. But the reason it's lifted up from the ground, right, is because he needs space to have the workers. They can't be in his space. They, you, won't, you don't want to have the kitchen right next to your dining room. It's dirty, it's stinky, it's loud, right? So you're always going to have these spaces separated so that they can basically live maybe pretend is a word, I'm not sure. You know, they can imagine that they live this very clean life, but the stuff is happening right underneath their feet or, you know, right in the building right next door kind of thing. 
like it is in Mount Vernon. So this is the original kitchen at Monticello. This is an actual passageway so that he doesn't have to see the black people doing stuff. They can use the passageways to get around the site. Um, and right, what's right above the passageway? Well, he can walk, right? That's his walking platform. Those arms that I told you about coming out from the building, which is of course beautiful today because you're looking out the Blue Ridge Mountains, right? You see the Green Valley. It's, it's really, really interesting. And I'm glad we have it to talk about for sure. Um, Cause you know, I mean, it's an essay in architecture, but it's also an essay in preservation because so much change has changed in, in really a short amount of time. They ripped out historic boxwoods at both TJ sites, you know, and boxwoods are, people, are flowers that are plants that people feel very passionate about, you know, but they weren't from his period. So out they went and everybody's like, oh no, you know, but you, you get over it. Um, <laughs> this is Mulberry Row. And I don't think I have another picture, no. So, the house is like, you know, the house Monticello's right here. There is a path right here with um, single space dwelling, like one room dwelling built of wood frame going along here. And then the third row is the vegetable garden, which I talked about with these two pavilions, um, classical with uh, Chip Chinese Chippendale uh, design work, fretwork at the top. And again, looking over vineyards and vegetables, and he could sit in that pavilion, you know, and look, look out, look down, whatever he was going to do. Um, just, you know, always uh, going to be important from here on out to always ensure that we remember the people that made that lifestyle uh, possible. And so these are actually um, pictures from Poplar Forest that we, this is actually one of my books, and this is uh, an interpretive drawing. Um, this is Poplar Forest, his little octagon retreat home, which has a dug out um, lawn, like this coming out from the house, and it was dug by hand by one individual who after a long day of work was paid a little bit of money to go and dig that lawn, that sunken lawn that Jefferson wanted, right? So the kind of things um, that enslaved people would do to earn some more money, put something away, because they had families to take care of too. And so this is the house I was just talking about. Um, I'm gonna guess there's far fewer hands. Has anyone been to Poplar Forest? Yeah, it's, it's um, kind of a hidden, treat and a hidden retreat. Um, it was a three day carriage ride in Thomas Jefferson's era from Monticello to this place. The only people that he allowed to go basically with him were his two granddaughters and a pile of books. He, oh, he, had, he had books that were miniature for traveling and he had a special bookcase for those miniature books to travel with him between the two houses. Um, it has an arm, like we've talked about. It's missing the other arm, but today it actually has a row of trees, which was Thomas Jefferson's idea. It's Virginia, it's hot in the summer. It's good to have trees over you. It has extra large windows to let in the breezes. It has shutters that work to close the house when you needed to close it from the sun. It has Chinese Chippendale details. And it has this portico that looks just like what we've seen on Monticello and on so many other things, right? Here are the Blue Ridge Mountains in the back background. He owned um, thousands upon thousands of acres of land, like a lot of these folks did, and they don't have to be contiguous, right? So George Washington's farms, he had, George Washington had five farms. Um, Mount Vernon was comprised of five, but they were all connected. But that's not true for TJ. His land holdings were in several places. This is the, um, cube dining room at Poplar Forest because it is a perfect octagon, literally. It's an octagon building. It's considered to be the first octagon designed and used for a domestic space in the United States. And so therefore the inner room is a cube and um, it's all finished now, but very neoclassical. 
right? It's that gray and white contrasting scheme. Um, it's got a herringbone floor today, got Windsor chairs and um, a little statuary by Houdon. Um, we've talked a little bit about education. We talked a little bit about his homes. Um, just really quickly, he never stopped. This is the thing about Thomas Jefferson that I can certainly appreciate, and I think you do too. He never stopped learning. He was active and active learner until the very end. And this is a little story that actually goes along with, do you consider New Hampshire your neighbors, your good neighbors? Are they good neighbors? Your good, they're your neighbors. I'm like, okay. And so it was, you have the white mountains and they have the green. Am I right? The other way around? You're green. So did you guys lose or was they who lost the man in the mountain? New Hampshire. So those are the green, you're saying? Those are white. I'm never going to get that right. See, I'm from Connecticut. What do I know? Um, OK, those mountains were thought of in the 18th century as being the tallest mountains in the United States because they hadn't seen the Rockies, right? Anything like that. And so Thomas Jefferson was like, I'm going to prove them wrong, and I'm going to write about it in my book. He wrote only one book. It's called Notes on the State of Virginia, and it's, called, it's all about Virginia. And he's proving that Virginia come the United States is as good as Europe. This is the point, right? Because Europe has everything older, bigger, better. Well, what do these upstarts have? Well, he's going to say, well, Virginia is going to be the crown prince here because it's my state, and I'm going to prove that my mountain in the Blue Ridge Mountains is bigger than that New Hampshire one or whatever, right? And so he's an old guy and he climbs the mountain, like it's 72, okay, it's not that old, but he, you know, it's whatever, it's 1790, you know, it's 1810. He's climbing the mountain with his surveyor's chain kind of thing and he's taking mathematical notations and he climbs back down. Oh, he take a botanist with him. Like he has a lot of friends who are botanists. So they're botanizing as they go and studying the plants and the trees. And he comes back down and he goes back to Poplar Forest and sits and he does his mathematical notations. And according to him, it was Virginia's taller. So he probably, you know, first he publishes it and he's like, I'm so proud of myself. This is great. You know, I've told you all. And then some other people start writing the newspapers. Thomas Jefferson got these mathematical notations wrong. This is wrong. And then they put there in, and he actually has to say, I was wrong in the newspapers, which is something that if you study the founding fathers, they do not like to admit ever, right, that they have been proved wrong. But he is kind of big enough at the end of his life to, to do that. So that's, this was a recreation of that um, journey up the mountain. That's the Peaks of Otter. And as we're just actually finishing up here, I thought you would like to see how many versions of Thomas Jefferson they are, there are, depending on place. Where are you and what is the message you want to get across in your place? Well, if you're in Williamsburg at the Market Square, you want Thomas Jefferson to be someone you can approach. He's a, he's a friendly guy. He's sitting on the bench. You can sit on the bench next to him. You write letters. He writes letters. OK, we don't even write letters anymore. But this was made probably in, in our 1980s letter writing still days. So he's approachable here. If you want Thomas Jefferson to uh, grace your school because he is a surveyor and he knows how to read maps and that's what you're teaching your students, OK, he can be that. Great. If you want Thomas Jefferson and his words to in penetrate the American public when they visit Washington, D.C., the capital of the U.S., well, he can be that, too. And then, you know, he can be other things. <laughs> and he should be, because he, he is all these things. That's the thing about him. He's all these things. Have you been here? Anyone reckon? Right? The American Museum? Culture and history, African American, AAMC. I can't get the, the acronym right. Here's Thomas Jefferson, and he is represented by all the enslaved people that he owned, a brick for each person that he owned, right? So he is that too. 
And, you know, and I should just say, you know, unlike George Washington, right? George Washington freed the enslaved people that belonged to him when George wrote his last will. Thomas Jefferson did not do that. Thomas Jefferson remains central to the American story. So my question to all of you is what should his role be today in the 21st century? And how do we share and maybe encourage people who, let's face it, aren't from the 20th century. Most of us are from the 20th century, right? But a lot of kids today are from the 21st century and they don't have the same experience and the same thing. So what do we do with TJ today? That's my question. And I say, you know, can we remember that he did encourage enlightenment, right? He's part of the European mindset called enlightenment, which means to have a curiosity, to pursue that curiosity through study and, you know, to do it through travel and to do it for everybody, right? And not just for, for you and yours, but for everybody. Okay, um, really quick quiz. Quiz time. I have four minutes. <laughs> what was Thomas Jefferson's favorite vegetable? Number two, what plant is named for Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> Number three, which founding father, we already did this, died on the same day? And what was that day? And, and the last, right, July 4th, 1826. And who were his two friends who lived near him and were also presidents? There you go. Peas? Yeah. Peas. Right? He died the same day that John Adams did, but who died first? John Adams. I don't think about it. Jefferson died first, and he said what? Adams. Adams lives. I think. So, is the other way around? Uh, wait a second. So, if Jefferson died, f so, yeah, then who said? Oh, and he didn't know because the Boston to Charlottesville hadn't made the news. Cool. So thank you. This is a plant that comes out for like two weeks in the spring. It's precious. It's called twin leaf Jeffersonia. And it's when you see it, you're just like, oh my God, you know, and then you go back the next day, it's gone. It's just one of those Virginia things. And it is Madison and Monroe who do live in the same orbit together. And they live in their own neoclassical houses and have their own slaves, right? So that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'm not gonna be able to answer any questions, so don't ask anything hard, but you can ask soft questions. <laughs> I'll take soft. Yes, sir. Um, I think it was in Monticello, one of the Canadian Mm-hmm. Mm and uh, it was when it was supposed to be for seven days, and he designed it wrong, so he just got a whole thing. Yeah, thank you for that reminder. Yes, he's just, <laughs> it's a great way to think about your house, right, <laughs> being that, don't worry about cutting open that floor. Don't, you know, don't, you, you, can, you can get another piece of wood. Um, in the service of science, like he would do something like that. And today we're so precious. And we think about these historic houses. Oh my gosh, you know, don't sit on that seat. Don't touch that wall. Th these houses were used, so. Did, did he also design the serpentine wall at UVA? The serpentine walls, you know, there are none at Monticello. And they were early, but I don't, I don't know if I can say that, because I think it's the Serpentine Wall, which is a, a single row of brick, that if you needed to build a wall around your garden and you built a single brick wall, it would, it would be very yeah. fragile. But if you build it in a serpentine pattern, it's stable. And so it's, it's, and it's elegant, it's beautiful, because um, it lends interest to the eye. And so I, I just don't know if that was him, yeah. Yeah. Anything else, peeps? Can you repeat the question? question for our viewing audience? Uh, the question. Uh, well, the next one. Okay. Maybe from here on in. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Sure. You asked a question. Yeah. What do the 21st century people think about him? Yes. And I'm thinking here in the 21st century, we are suffering from this, uh, this uh, 
I don't even know what the word is, but you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm totally right and you're totally wrong. Right. And here was someone who was right about a lot of things and wrong a lot about a lot of things. In fact, he didn't even touch on his children who were also his slaves and so forth. Yep. So yep. I think the lesson from Jefferson is that we're human beings and we're not perfect and you can't throw the good stuff just because you don't like the bad stuff and you can't cut off communication because you then lose the opportunity to help correct the bad stuff. That's right. So for our viewers, um, we're talking now about what do we do with Thomas Jefferson or any founding father basically in the 21st century, especially as we approach 2026. So what are you going to do with your founding father for 2026, Ethan Allen? <laughs> yeah, you have any Thanks good? All, <laughs> <laughs> all right. I didn't realize I was signing up for that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> any other questions or thoughts? No? Yeah. How did that in the long run soften his image in some scenario or is it just like a great question the question is what how do we talk about sally hemings what does she mean to thomas jefferson's story or should it really just be about her and who cares you know what i mean he's had his say now what does his story do for her i don't you know i don't know any thoughts here about sally and and their six children yeah <laughs> it's still hard it's still hard for people to talk about what do you think? Been to Monticello and seeing the little closet that she's yeah. going to sleep in. Yeah, it says a lot. Yeah, like of of using of using someone. Yeah. yeah, he got what he needed out of that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, they, um, Monticello did uh, put in a new Sally Hemings exhibit um, in that space, which is in underneath near the kitchen. It's in one of those under under Croft rooms and there are no pictures of Sally. I mean, now, how many images do we have of Thomas Jefferson? A thousand to go along with that thousand books, right? He's on the nickel, um, but we have nothing of her. So very often historic sites use a silhouette kind of imagery, but uh, Monticello did it kind of uniquely in that they project a silhouette on the wall, I think. And so it's kind of evocative of um, a, her presence, which we know is is part of this home, but you know she doesn't get to kind of be there. And we try to, you know, in historic houses, show them in concrete ways through the tools, right? If a kitchen's set up, it's not set up because Mrs. Thomas Jefferson's going to get to work, right? It's set up for the enslaved people to do their work. So you try to get it at that way, but it still leaves you kind of cold because it's not human. So where can you find that human connection? Um, to Sally. And there's just a lot of great stories happening. A friend of mine who is um, the director of interpretation at Stratford Hall, which is Robert E. Lee's family home, um, they are doing a project, and I think it involves Mount Vernon, to focus, highlight the cooks in all of these Virginia historic homes, all the enslaved cooks, because some of them did some not only amazing things with food, they were the folks who actually brought French cooking. It always, you know, you think oh, Thomas Jefferson loved French, French cuisine, and so he brought it to us. No, <laughs> he didn't learn a thing about it. He made it happen so that his enslaved cooks could do that work. They had to build, you know, special um, uh, flame, little stoves that are meant for French cooking, and you can, you can actually see them in these, these pictures. Um, and so a friend of mine is doing that work. So, in other words, you can get through interpretation now in different ways that are, I think, really interesting for people. Um, oh, yeah, well, I mean, there she is in front, but did I have a picture of the kitchen? Yeah. Did, 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 did I pass it? Lots of little, like, love. little ovens. There, there they are. This is, a, this is because this is French cuisine right here because this is for sauces. You make the, each one kind of on its, in its own little, little place, um, little... You know, and then you have the big hearth to do the bigger meat kind of cooking um, and all the copperware and, you know, the ceramic ware, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's a great story, you know, and as you could tell, I'm a big fan of Mount Vernon, too. So I recommend if you haven't been to either in a while, it's worth it. Yeah. Yes, sir. 
you're mentioning what we don't know what uh, Sally Hemings looked like, yeah. but a lot of historians think that she was likely the half sister of Jefferson. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And that if you know what your wife looked like. Good. Yes. Yeah. That. No, it, that's a really great point. Um, the point is that these people intermarried black and white forcibly. You know, maybe there are some love relationships there and there are a lot of light skinned black people because of this forced relationship. And that was true of Sally. I think that she had lighter skin um, because she was a product of that kind of master slave owner relationship with her own mother. And it kind of just repeats itself until the end of slavery. Yeah. Right. All right, folks, it's Sunday. Have a great time outside. Thank you for having me. <laughs>